Uh, so I have known Dr. Keller for many, many years. And, you know, the first time I met him, he was in Fairbanks. And then I met him several times in, you know, Fairbanks and in Alaska. And he's a, he's a, a great a person that, you know, that I, I know, and then also we have been collaborating, you know, the you know, some of the work together, and he is now doing the computational chemistry, and you know, it's, it's our pleasure to uh, bring him for the virtual seminar of the chemistry department, and welcome, Dr. Keller. Hi, Thep, and and Nan, and uh, all you chemistry people in uh, in uh, Odessa. Thanks a lot to Thep and the uh, Department of Chemistry for inviting me to give a talk. Today's talk has to do with these. Uh, this molecule on the left will have lots to say about that and how it self-destructs, you might say, to make a carbon monoxide molecule and a couple of other uh, fragments. Yeah, I'd like to give credit to uh, Thep and Nen. Uh, like, uh, as he mentioned, we've been friends for a long time when they were up in Alaska, and it's been a long and fruitful collaboration, which uh, I've been very grateful for, They're really nice folks. The uh, Also, I'd like to give credit to uh, our uh, Department of Chemistry up here, uh, where I uh, was able to do a lot of co uh, computing on the machines and software up here, as well as at the Geophysical Institute, where they also have an installation of computational chemistry software. Thirdly, the some calculations were done with the uh, National Science Foundation Exceed program, which is gives access to faculty and students to supercomputers at UC San Diego, uh, Texas A&M, and some other places like that. So the talk is in uh, basically three parts. I'm going to uh, give us some background on the carbon monoxide chemistry and biology, as well as some basic facts of computation, basic ideas of computational chemistry. The uh, second part has to do with this trimethylamine borane carboxylic acid, the formula shown on the right there, which is the prodrug carbon monoxide releasing molecule that we're investigating and that uh, Thep and Nen have done a lot of experimental work on prior to this theoretical work. Then uh, the third part will focus on the uh, borane carboxylate ion, which is a suggested intermediate in this reaction uh, that comes out of the calculations. We published a paper in the Royal Society of Chemistry Advances in 2020 describing all the work that's in this seminar. So I'll, today will be a distillation of that there's a lot of details and things in there that we won't be able to uh, show today, but we'll try to give you the high, po high points. Okay, well, as we know, high concentrations of uh, carbon monoxide are deadly. And they, this happens by uh, CO interacting with the hemoglobin molecule and blocking oxygen transfer in, in the blood. Uh, it turns out that there's uh, actually very low concentrations of carbon monoxide that are naturally produced in the body by uh, enzymes, especially heme oxygenase. I'll show a picture of that in just a minute here. But so also this carbon monoxide is, seems to be similar in chemistry and, and biochemistry to nitric oxide and uh, may have a regulatory role in, in the body. And so uh, this suggests that uh, manipulating the levels of carbon monoxide in the body could be of therapeutic, therapeutic use. So in other words, either maybe increasing the amount of CO or decreasing it somehow could be a, an avenue for treatment of disease. A couple of very nice reviews came out last year that are listed there at the bottom, one in the journal Nitric Oxide, interestingly, because of the similarity of CO and NO, and the other one in the Journal of Molecular Sciences. In some ways, CO is very similar to NO. Uh, after all, NO, nitri nitric oxide, contains one more proton, one more electron, because the nitrogen being the next atom up in the periodic table. The NO, as I mentioned, is a well-known signaling molecule. And because of the chemical similarities with CO, that's, that's the basis for suggesting that there's some regulatory role for CO. Size-wise, these are very similar molecules. This, these are what's called electron density sur isosurfaces. Let's try, there's a three-dimensional surface here where all these points equal 0 0.06 electrons per cubic angstrom. So this is an arbitrary definition of size of the molecule. And uh, clearly, they're virtually identical in, in size. 
uh, you can paint onto the surface uh, polarity information for molecules on a color scale. And this is called the electrostatic potential map. It's mapped onto the electron density surface. <clears throat> the, on this color scale, the red color corresponds to a high electron negative zone in the molecule. And the blue color is a more positive zone. The positive characteristics of this, of this area right here and this uh, band in CO have to do with the, the effect of the nuclear charge of oxygen, nitrogen, or, or carbon. So if there's a low density of electrons, then this, the, a, a, an atom or, or a, an electron up here would feel a, a positive field. So anyway, both of these molecules have a electron dense spot at one end and some of this uh, electropositive region in, in the middle of the molecule. You can see that in some protein structures that are, have come out recently that's showing the binding of these molecules to uh, proteins. The, um, so there's two crystal structures, uh, at least two, in the protein data bank. That's what this PDB stands for. Uh, that sh uh, one for nitric oxide synthase and one for heme oxygenase. They, they both feature a protein. That's what all this blue stuff is. It's all this complex amino acid structure. But buried inside this is a heme molecule. This is the same molecule that's in hemoglobin. It's just in, a, in an enzyme that metabolizes carbon monoxide. It has an iron atom. That's this thing right here. And this is the nitrogen and oxygen uh, of the nitric oxide bound to that. So you see very, it's very similar. Heme oxygenase, which binds carbon monoxide, that's what that's it way down there. If you get a close-up of that, you can see it's the same heme structure. It's a different protein structure. And uh, looks like in this one, the CO is bound to the lower surface of the, of the iron rather than the upper surface. But these uh, just the similarities between these suggest that there's very similar biochemical properties for NO and CO. And hence, we expect them to be biologically in similar in terms of physiological function. OK, this shows the uh, results from the, a paper by uh, Thep and Nen in 2018, where they described this, uh, well, rather mysterious reaction of trimethylamine borane carboxylic acid. And uh, what they showed was that when they dissolved trimethylamine borane carboxylic acid in a neutral pH aqueous solution uh, and follow this with uh, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, uh, they could see the production of trimethylamine and boric acid or borate ion. And then they could uh, see the carbon monoxide gas bubbling off. What was striking about this was that, the, that these were the only molecules, uh, looking at the boron specifically, the only molecules that uh, they could see in the reaction. There was nothing else uh, seemingly produced during the reaction, just the final products popping out at the end. And this generally is not the way reactions, chemical reactions occur. There must be some kind of intermediate. It's just that they can't be seen. So two questions, at least, come up here. One is, uh, why is the reaction so slow? And uh, Thep showed that it takes a, about a week or half of this, the boring carboxylate to react. Uh, and the other is this issue of the intermediates. Why are there no intermediates observed in this reaction? You know, this is the kind of thing that one wants to know if you're going to design a drug or redesign a drug. You know, what is it really doing in solution? What are the mechanisms of reaction? And if you know that, then you could you can uh, adjust the structure, for instance, to make it less stable, more of a reactive, or more stable, or perhaps possibly uh, adjusting its solubility properties. You know, if you look at this in the reaction in a little more detail, you see that actually this is, uh, like you might say the consequences of this, of this reaction for this molecule are dire. You know, uh, counting the bonds that react, five bonds are broken. And while only two are formed, you know, the two being the, the, the third bond in carbon monoxide and somehow a boron oxygen bond 
you know, one of these over here is formed in this reaction. So how does all this happen? Like I said, this, these don't just sort of all pop off and, and form all at the same time. There must be some intermediate. And uh, by looking at these reactions from a computational point of view, we've discovered a, a possible answer to this. So in a nutshell, what the computational studies using uh, the quantum theory uh, shows that the actual reactant in this is likely not to be the acid itself. It's likely to be the conjugate base, the carboxylate. And that this then uh, breaks apart, breaks the nitrogen carbon bond and kicks off the trimethylamine molecule, that's one of these, and makes a cyclic intermediate, the borane carboxylate ion. And that is the thing that releases carbon monoxide and a, another a, a molecule called a boronate ion. Well, this is a unstable molecule. It's of reactive species with these boron hydrogen bonds. It's been shown that these, if this is produced in water, that it rapidly reacts to form borate. So it's reasonable that, that this would be the source of the borate ion in the product. So now I'm going to go show some more of the details on how we arrived at this picture. And finally, show uh, the, the energy values and rate constants that you can derive from the calculations. So we've, be, because these are the two crucial steps in here, the splitting of the nitrogen boron bond and the release of the carbon monoxide. This is where the new chemistry, you might say, happens. Losing a proton from a carboxylic acid, on the other hand, is, is not new chemistry. As far as the details of the theory that we used, we used the software Gaussian 09 and a density functional method called MO6, MO6-2x and with the 631++G 2DP basis set. Finally, this used a, a technique called the po uh, polarizable continuum model, which sort of envelops the whole molecule in a, a surface that uh, tries to uh, mimic the polarity of water without actually showing a water molecule. Turns out you actually need to show a water molecule. We'll show, we'll, we, we investigated that point in quite a bit of detail, which I'll show you the results of. But there's really no need to, to worry too much about this detailed method. However, it's good to remember the, the basic idea of what, what's happening here. We're using a very advanced software that that uses at, its, at the core the Schrodinger equation and solves the Schrodinger equation for a geometry of a molecule. You know, the Schrodinger equation, H psi equals E psi. The H is called the Hamiltonian function. This describes the potential and kinetic energy of the electrons in it, originally in the hydrogen atom, but now as modern theory progresses in larger atoms and in whole molecules, the basic idea is the same. The size is a function of X, Y, and Z. It describes the spatial distribution of the electron waves around an atom or molecule. And E, there is the energy of electrons in a given orbital. This is sometimes called the oracle of chemistry because it really tells you where the electrons are, what they're doing, what, they're, what the energy of the molecule is, and all chemical reactions and structures flow out of the Schrodinger equation. We can just review basically, you know, what's involved with quantum mechanics or quantum theory, which state that a bond in a molecule is an orbital that spans two or more atoms. So the molecular, that would be a molecular orbit, derived mathematically from atomic orbitals by taking their sum and difference. So the simplest case here, and this is this discussed in your text in your chain textbook. I'll just revise in your gen, general chemistry textbook. When two, there's you can imagine this as two separate hydrogen atoms with their 1s orbitals uh, approaching each other, coming together and forming the H2 molecule. When that happens, you get two molecular orbitals. One is the sum of those two spherical functions, and the other one. It's called an antibond, is the difference, mathematical difference between those two. That creates a, a node, a region of zero probability between those two. In the hydrogen molecule, this is an empty orbital. It's there, but 
uh, it's not filled with electrons. So this is typical of, of molecular orbitals in, in of all sizes is that there's a set of filled uh, orbitals of stable uh, energies and then a corresponding set uh, of antibonding orbitals that are unfilled. Uh, you can see the same thing happening with uh, uh, in carbon monoxide. I'll just show how the 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 origin of the sigma bond. There's a, there's three bonds between C and O. One is the sigma bond uh, that's formed by the interaction of the p orbitals on the carbon and oxygen. So when they come close together, they form the sigma bond here, which is the you can see you add up these two and you get a big fat thing in the middle. That's a sigma bond, a cylindrical shape. If you take the difference between those two you end up with something with a node between two p orbitals. The color scale is just artificially assigned for in the uh, Gaussian software for a filled orbital, red and blue, and an unfilled one, green and yellow. They are in na in naturally, of course, not colored. Okay, let's take a little uh, look at then at the uh, trimethylamine borane carboxylic acid. This is the uh, starting compound for this reaction. And the calculations show that the most stable geometry of this, of the carboxylate ion, and now I have removed the proton here and showing the carboxylate. And this is the shape of this, that's, that uh, A is the most stable shape, most likely to see this if you were to look in solution. And B is the one that leads directly to the formation of the intermediate and the release of carbon monoxide. And why is this? Well, uh, you can look at this uh, in terms of the rotation of around some of these different bonds. Here, this being a single bond, uh, is, this part of the molecule is free to rotate around this end here. And we can uh, characterize this and understand it by looking straight down the boron nitrogen bond like that. If you guys are taking organic chemistry, you may, this may look similar to you as a Newman projection. But this shows, this allows you to quantify what the rotational position of this is relative to the other end. This, is, this particular conformation is called a staggered conformation. And uh, these conformations just relate to different positions of the rotatable group around that sig sigma bond. So the staggered conformation has a, an angle between the bonds at, on either atom. So this is connected to the back atom. This is connected to the hydrogen in the front. And the angle between those is called the torsion angle, 60 degrees. That kind of makes intuitive sense, you see, because that places this big carboxylate group midway between two bulky methyl groups. Okay, there's another important rotatable bond and that's to the carboxylate itself. And we can do the same thing here and look at this one down that bond and look at it at the end there. Now this one is another type of conformation. This is called an eclipsed conformation. And in this one, the, the oxygen lines up directly with the atoms behind it. And the torsion angle on this one is zero degrees. Why, why does it do that? Well, you, over here you can see this oxygen is trying to get away from these two hydrogens over here. Also, actually the nitrogen has a partial positive charge and the oxygen has a partial negative charge. So they might, you might imagine that they were, there's an attractive force there. So this is, you arrive at this by twisting this group around and testing different conformations, seeing which one is the most stable. So this is the final result of that sort of a calculation. Okay, so now let's uh, compare the acid in the base form. Why is it that the uh, carboxylate is more reactive and more prone to undergo the, the subsequent reaction? The, and actually both of these, the acid itself and the carboxylate adopt this uh, staggered uh, eclipsed conformation that we just described. 
And there's some interesting differences between these that are uh, diagnostic, you might say, of, of, of why the carboxylate is uh, as reactive as, as it is. So what I've shown here are beside each bond, two numbers. One is the distance, the bond distance in angstroms. And the other is the bond order, uh, which is a number that refers to uh, the strength of the bond, really. It, it can be zero, of course, for nothing. One for a full single bond, two for a double bond, like in an alkene, three for a triple bond, like in acetylene or carbon monoxide. But uh, what the calculation shows is that the, this bond distance in the carboxylic acid, the boron nitrogen distance is 1.607 angstroms. And this is uh, a bond order of only, surprisingly, 0 0.60 something. Uh, and now I've also looked at this distance between the oxygen and the boron. Just put a dotted line in there because there really isn't much of a bond there. The bond order suggests that this is about 1% of a uh, uh, single bond, 2.46 angstroms. Okay, so you pull the hydrogen off, and what, how does this change the structure? Well, this distance between oxygen and boron decreases ever so slightly, and the and while there's still not a full bond there, this actually has 6% of a bond between these two atoms. And on, on the uh, nitrogen side, this boron nitrogen bond now is lengthened and the bond order decreases. So that's, this is actually uh, predicts what's going to happen when this actually gets enough energy to uh, carry out this uh, fragmentation reaction. This is this uh, carboxylate is all set up to form a bond across here and break that one. So that's a longer bond. It's weaker by 10% compared to the carboxylic acid. And this uh, uh, boron oxygen distance is shorter. And already it's bonded by something like 6%. This shows a, uh, a picture of the orbitals of the carboxylate. And this, uh, and shown here is an orbital on oxygen. This is a P, you may recognize this as a P orbital. This is where a pair of electrons on oxygen resides. And this is in very close contact. It overlaps with an anti-bond, anti-bonding orbital on the boron nitrogen uh, side. And what this is doing is actually donating electron density into this anti-bond which weakens it. And you can see actually as this, when, the, when this reacts, this begins to form a bond across here by combining those two orbitals. So that's a P orbital with two electrons. This is the anti-bond, sigma star bond, or the boron nitrogen, a part of the molecule. And so what happens then, when, like I say, when this gets enough thermal energy bouncing around in the solution, then the, uh, then this atom just swings over and stuffs electrons into this orbital onto the backside of boron and makes a bond across there. When it does that, then this, uh, these electrons pop out and go back onto nitrogen. This is called a nucleophilic substitution reaction. Uh, nucleo a nucleus loving because this uh, these electrons want to bond to that boron nucleus. And that gives, on the one side, trimethylamine. You can see this pair of electrons, you see, used to be that bond right there. And the organic chemists use this curved arrow notation to show that this pair of electrons comes out of here and goes back on nitrogen. And this, again, shows the P orbital electrons forming a bond over to boron. Okay, let's look at the boron carboxylate. So this is now uh, the carbon monoxide releasing reaction. And this is uh, a type of reaction called a chelotropic reaction. And that is one where both bonds are broken at the same time. And, this, and uh, if you want to account for the electrons here, then you could put this pair of electrons to form the triple bond 
and this carbon oxygen pair of electrons to go back onto oxygen like that. So this formed carbon monoxide, and this is the boronate ion. Actually, these chelotropic reactions are fairly common. Different kinds are known. Uh, the one that's closest in terms of atomic uh, molecular structure is the uh, is a reaction of a alpha acetolactone. And while this is not a known compound in solution, it has been seen in a mass spectrometer. If you uh, there's a cyclopropanone reaction that's known. It's this this three-membered ring is cyclopropanone. It has two alkyl groups on here, heated to 150 degrees, gives off carbon monoxide and forms a double bond. Uh, probably the most famous example of this because it occurs at just above room temperature is a decarbonylation of a anthracenone molecule to give anthracene. And this is a very stable aromatic thing, which uh, means that this reaction is uh, much easier to uh, accomplish. As I mentioned, we can, we can derive energy change numbers out of these calculations. And to do so, we need to remember some of the basic thermo thermodynamic uh, qu quantities that are involved in these calculations. Uh, and the first is the enthalpy, which probably comes as close to a description of energy as, as uh, we can with the formal thermodynamic quantities. The enthalpy refers to uh, bond strengths, or if there's a solvent present, uh, solvation energies. And uh, so delta H would be the change in the bond strength uh, as the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. If this is an exothermic reaction, th that is if the products are more stable than the reactants, then delta H is less than zero. So that's the hallmark of an exothermic reaction is a negative delta H. Another important quantity here, especially in the reaction that we're looking at uh, today, is entropy, which you could say means uh, disorder, uh, is the change in emotional freedom of atoms. And so this could uh, come about by an increase in the number of particles or just the increase in the floppiness of the, of the product molecule compared to the reactant. Uh, the delta S is the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. And uh, so if the number of particles increases, then delta H is greater than zero. That's the, and the current reaction, you know, the boron carboxylate splits apart into two things. And so that means that's a large increase in entropy. The actual driving force for chemical reactions is the combination of those two called Gibbs free energy, delta G. And it's mathematically given as the <clears throat> delta, uh, delta H for the reaction minus the absolute temperature, T, times delta S. So that minus sign there is, is very important because it says that if you have a positive uh, delta S, then this term is negative. If the reaction is exothermic, then this whole thing, then this makes this even more negative, and this gives a negative delta G of reaction. So if there's a, the, the size of delta G in a negative sense gives the, what, what's called the driving force for the reaction. Large negative delta G gives a strong driving force for the reaction. When we calculate this now at the level of theory that I mentioned before, and for just this fragmentation reaction, actually it's slightly endothermic. In other words, these bonds really are not that much more stable than the, than the boring carboxylate. Uh, however, as I mentioned, this, uh, because this is a fragmentation reaction, the large positive entropy change. And so because of that negative sign in the formula for delta G, this has a negative delta G, a uh, rather strong driving force for this reaction because it's splitting apart two molecules. That's what I just said. 
Now, uh, here's where we bring water into the picture here. And uh, this turns out to be an important feature of this, uh, of these, both of these reactions, the, these, the trimethylamine splitting reaction and the carbon monoxide producing reaction. So I'm uh, just showing the results here of what, what we've found by adding a water molecule in here, hydrogen bonding to the, to the most likely low position here, this oxygen. When you do that, basically you get the same reaction, carbon monoxide spitting off. However, this now is uh, fairly exothermic. The entropy change is about the same, you see, because you've got one particle here and two particles here. These are stuck together and form one particle. And so that makes this an even stronger driving force when uh, uh, you include a water molecule in this calculation. So hydrogen bonding increases the driving force for this reaction. We can put this on a, a free energy scale here where the reactants are on the left. We're, we're putting Gibbs free energy uh, scale on the y-axis and the reaction progress from reactants to products on the x-axis. And this shows a, a negative delta G for the reaction. But uh, what we're really interested in here is not only the overall energy change, but what happens when in the process of splitting carbon monoxide off. We want to know what happens uh, along the path to the products. And the short answer is that as in 99% of all reactions, the energy, both H and G, increases to a maximum and then decreases to give the product. And this uh, is called delta G of activation, free energy of, of activation. And it's a barrier to, uh, a thermal barrier to the reaction. So not all molecules will automatically go to the product. They have to gain a certain amount of excess extra energy just by the thermal motions inside the solution to get over this barrier and to knock off the carbon monoxide molecule. And why does the energy go up? Well, it's just because, you know, you're forming new bonds, and, uh, but they have, that doesn't make up for the energy that's lost by breaking some bonds. So, so the energy must go up to a maximum and then finally form the, the stable bonds of the products. What does this thing look like? This thing in the middle uh, is a, uh, it's called a transition state. It's the highest energy geometry going from the reactions to the products. So, you know, this is a vitally important thing, this transition state, but it only, but it does not have a finite lifetime. Uh, with rare exceptions, these cannot be studied by themselves, isolated or, or studied uh, in, in terms of a regular chemical. But they're important because their uh, energy and shape define the top of that curve. So this is why theory, uh, quantum theory is so powerful for studying chemistry is that we can in fact look at the transition state and determine its energy and predict the rate of the reaction with the quantum methods. So, we're going to look at the energy, the geometry, and the vibrations of this transi transition state. It's going to tell us about the whys and the wherefores of this reaction. So I'd like to briefly uh, uh, just mention what, uh, where some of these uh, reactions come from. And this is from a potential energy surface. It's, it describes the energy of a whole range, all kinds of different arrangements of a boron, carbon, oxygen, and two hydrogens. And one thing you can do with these is to uh, negotiate this surface and search for minima by a stepwise process. This is a way to identify stable molecules, such as the boron carboxylate. Uh, but you can also do this, uh, investigate these surfaces by following the uh, slope 
of the potential energy surface upwards to look for energy maximum. And the uh, computer software finds those maximums, identifies these as a, as a transition state. So the transition states are at the top of these uh, potential energy curves and real molecules and products you see are at the bottom. But we take the energy difference between those and that gives us the theoretical uh, delta G of activation. And so it tells us you know, two things, what the sh actual shape of this is and what the energy difference is to reach that point. Uh, and as you can imagine, these values are, these bonds are st stretched way out from the stable molecules. Seems to stretch more on the CO side than the CB side. Um, I'm going to skip this section here. We can also characterize these uh, transition states by their vibrational properties. Uh, and if, perhaps during the question time, I can come back and, and show this in more detail. So as I uh, su suggested before, the, we measure the, the energy for up to the top of this curve it's uh, for the uh, carboxyborane itself, this distance is 15.8 kcals per mole. We can use an equation that's actually similar to the Arrhenius equation that you study in the second semester of general chemistry. It's called an I-ring equation. And it takes this free energy of activation and calculates the rate constant for that process. It does require uh, several constants, and you do have to add in the absolute temperature of the reaction, T. Actually, it's easier, uh, I find it easier to relate to the half-life of a reaction. Uh, rate constants are a little bit abstract, but the half-life, which is defined as ln2 over the rate constant, uh, is a little easier to understand. The units of rate constants are in per second, so if you put that in the denominator, then your half-life comes out in seconds or hours or months. And if, uh, using this 15.8 uh, energy of activation, you see that this has a half-life of about, uh, here it is, 43 milliseconds. And this is the, the Y scale here on this, plot of half-life versus uh, free energy, the Y scale is a log scale in seconds. I mean, so this is a huge, it's interesting that, you know, with not too many kcals per mole difference in the, in the energy of activation, you go from a nanosecond half-life to three months or so. Well, uh, here also is the number, uh, for uh, the boron, boron carboxylate with a water molecule. And that, re, that decreases the energy of activation by something like five kcals per mole. And so that's this point you see on this. De and it decreases the half-life down to microsecond range. So, you know, this carboxyborane ion is stable, but it, it reacts within microseconds in water solution giving off carbon monoxide. That's why no measurable amount can build up. Is it just so reactive? Here we can plot this process on, again, a free energy scale here, going from carboxyborane up to the transition state, down to the products. If we add a water molecule in there, this decreases this barrier to 11 kcal. You can see that this is about 11 versus 15 or 16 here. Okay. Uh, so now we can apply the same kind of analysis. I won't go into too, many, too much of the details here. But the first step of this reaction, the uh, uh, trimethylamine boring carboxylate fragmentation reaction, and find its maximum and what its transition state looks like. And uh, so this transition state, as you might imagine, it shows partial bond across here and a partial bond there. And this thing, you know, is a transition state. It doesn't have a real time 
it's this trans, it's the temporary structure as it goes and forms the product. That's what this double dagger refers to. And that process is, uh, goes up it pl plus 12 kcals per mole. So what happens now when we add a water molecule to this? And what do you think is going to happen? This is a rhetorical question. I don't raise your hand and give me an answer, but think about this. What happens, do you think, when we add a, a water molecule in here? Remember, this is partially positive, and it's going to be hydrogen bonding to this oxygen. This oxygen takes its electrons and forms a bond to boron in this re reaction. Something like that. So, what do you think happens here? Well, delta G increases by 14 kcals per mole. The water, hydrogen bonding water, is a huge effect on the fragmentation reaction. It's now 25 kcals per mole. And of course, the product, also the hydrogen bond remains here, and we saw that this goes on to the to the decarbonylation reaction. So we can plot this whole process now on an energy scale, starting from the hydrogen bonded uh, precursor carboxylate, going up to that transition state. You notice that this is 25 kcals per mole. It goes over to the fragmented product, and then this thing breaks apart with an 11 kcal per mole act, uh, energy of activation to give off carbon monoxide. You might, so you might say, well, gee, can't this go back over this curve right here? Well, practically it can't. The carboxyborane breaks apart so fast that they cannot find each other in solution to get back and over. You, for this to go back, it's a, it's a, it's a bimolecular reaction which depends on the concentration of both the reactants. So if one of these is vanishingly small because it's already gone on, lost carbon monoxide, you can't go back over that curve. So uh, let's see, when we uh, calculate this rate constant, I mentioned that this is 25 kcals per mole, the half-life corresponding to that is 66 hours, three days. So this comes very close to the, the number that I mentioned before, about a half-life of about a week, somewhat shy of that. Uh, but this, this is, you know, this explains why this is such a slow reaction to get the trimethylamine off is difficult and putting one or even more water molecules makes it even more difficult and even slower. Whereas the breaking apart of the Boron carboxylate is made easier by the water molecules, makes it react faster. So why is it so slow? Well, it's because breaking that bond is difficult and there's a bunch of, there's one or more hydrogen, uh, water molecules, hydrogen bonding to that, uh, that uh, slow down the fragmentation reaction. And why is no intermediate seen? It's because the, the intermediate boron carboxylate uh, with its attached water molecules breaks apart within microseconds. So what this uh, study shows, it, first of all, it reveals the existence of a new boron species, this cyclic bora, uh, boron carboxylate, a borane carboxylate ion, uh, has not been identified experimentally. And uh, I think it'd be very difficult <laughs> to identify it experimentally given its reactivity. Uh, number two, these results are consistent with the kinetics that Thep uh, and Nin observed uh, for the rea overall reaction, and the fact that there's no inter that they couldn't see in any intermediate. The intermediate is there, but it just reacts so fast that the concentration is, is too low to observe. And lastly, this shows how hydrogen bonding uh, affects is strong effect on this reaction. It stabilizes the reactant, but it destabilizes, it increases the rea reactivity of the boron carboxylate ion. So in summary, you know, it's known 100 years ago that the Schrodinger equation uh, would 
be able to predict all kinds of chemistry. At the time, they couldn't, because of the limitations in computational methods, couldn't do these calculations. But nowadays, we have uh, massive computing power and can calculate the Schrodinger equation solutions or, or approximations there too uh, in, within minutes. Now, you know, uh, we all know that it's always good to have experimental data, but with uh, lacking that, the computing power and software uh, of, that are used in theoretical calculations move us ever closer to chemical reality. Okay, I ran over a little bit, but I think there's time for questions. 